We're now moving on to page four of your notes and we're looking at this side control panel here which as you can see has 16 different buttons that we're going to work our way through. You can refer to your notes while looking at this video in tandem. So let's look at buttons one, two, three and four first off. We've already discussed the focus assist button. Beside this is the VF Bright viewfinder button our viewfinder luminance adjust knob and beside this is the VF peaking contour adjustment knob. As I said we've already discussed focus assist button. So what are these about? These are very simply put a VF peak and a VF bright for your viewfinder. I can't show you that but it's a contrast control that brightens or darkens the viewfinder and a contrast control that flattens or increases the contrast between the brightest and darkest points of your shot. You can adjust according to your heart's content it doesn't affect your recording, it's just how you like to perceive your image in the viewfinder and where the white lines are in the 12 o'clock position, that's what is recommended for the factory settings. Underneath those we have three user buttons. You have seen me use the user buttons in relation to media mode. If I go into media mode you know that when I press user 1 I can put an OK mark on the clip. When I press user 2 I can delete a clip and user 3 is simply for accessing a USB that you may plug into the side of the camera to take material off. These are all factory settings for the user buttons. But this is what the user buttons do in relation to media mode. In camera mode, they are slightly different. So, in camera mode, when I press user 1, I get what are called color bars. Now, color bars are something that are kind of disappearing from the industry. The idea of color bars were always twofold. Number one... When you had recorded something and you sent it into RTE or TG Car or whatever to be uh, broadcast, the vision mixer in there would do a color test. So using a dropper tool, he or she would make sure that each of the color values represented here on the RGB scale matched the color settings for the system that your show was going to be broadcast on. So it was always imperative back in the day to make sure you had 30 seconds worth of color bars on the top, top of anything you sent in for broadcast. It was also beneficial in the days of tape because with tape it always took about 30 seconds for the tape to unspool and you would get drop out while that happened. So a camera person would always record 30 seconds worth of these color bars for safety so that nothing happened in the first 30 seconds of recording that would have drop out on it that was crucial to the finished program. So user 1 brings up user bars, press it again and the user or color bars, the color bars disappear. We won't be using them. I'm pointing them out to you purely so that you can recognize that if you power up your camera and you're seeing this, the way you get rid of them is by pressing user 1. When I say we won't be using color bars, partly because in this day and age, the technology has come together so much that there isn't that much differentiation between JVC systems or Sony systems or Panasonic systems, so it's not as valid as it used to be. The second user button does what we call black stretch. This is just a preset in the factory. We can go into the menu and change this, but basically black stretch is what we use to compensate between the lightest and darkest part of a shot. So if we've got very strong contrast where we're seeing our zebra bars, by putting on black stretch, you can basically lighten the dark colors and brighten the light colors to balance out your shots. And user three in relation to camera mode is again allows you to import material from an external device. We tend not to use that that often either. Under the user buttons you will find the menu button. I want to draw a little bit of attention to this. In relation to the menu button when you press it you get a large menu quite similar to kind of the old Nokia phones Again, up, down, left, right in camera mode. It allows you to scroll down through a variety of functions and select the one you want to do, and there's sub-menus in there. So it's basically about changing and resetting a whole variety of options that you can do with the camera, which are available to you on the online manual that I posted on Lecture 1. However, we ask you not to go in and mess with this. There are a couple of occasions we will ask you to use it, uh, but in the main, we ask you to stay away from fiddling around with it because you can throw the camera off balance and we don't know what you've changed, you don't know what you've changed. So, when we do want you to use it, the primary one will be for media, which you see here. This can sometimes occur when you place a card in uh, for the first time, you may get a message on the screen that says, 
format card or format media or restore media. Please remember with all memory cards, if you format media, you are deleting everything on it and reformatting uh, the card to match the spe specs of this particular camera. And if you restore media, you're restoring the file system on the card that may have been uh, removed when you were editing with the card in your editing system. So it's straightforward enough. If I press the center button on media, you can see the options. Do you want to format media? Underneath that is, do you want to restore media? They're the only two options you're going to be asked if there is an issue with your card. So if you want to format it, you click yes and it formats the card. If you want to restore it, you click yes and it restores the card. And once you've done that, you go back and out. We will be using this also for time code, but we won't be covering that in this week's tutorial. To come out of the menu, you press the menu button again, the menu disappears and you're back onto your screen. We have discussed button number six on page four, the neutral density filter switch. Number seven is the one I said we would return to, the status button. So as I said, currently there are graphic displays on your screen here. If I press in my status button, I get further camera information relating to settings on the camera. If I press it again, I get further information in relation to full auto white balance, what the user one, two, and three settings are, and if I want to change them, etc., etc. But if I press again, I get a relatively blank screen. All that appears on this is the letters STBY and record, obviously, if I go into record mode. It's recommended that when you are framing your shot, you press the status until you get this clear screen. Once you've decided that is the frame you want on your shot and you're ready to record, you can record. But it's recommended that you press status again until such time as you see your little miniature channel one, channel two bouncing here and your time code up here and various other information here. But this is the one to watch out for. It's the only status display that has this. And why do we want that? Because this is the one that will tell you, for instance, if the full auto shooting button is accidentally on because the letters FAS will appear. So in terms of the buttons we're going to go through here, things will appear here if they are on and shouldn't be on. So it's a handy way of keeping track and making sure that you're recording what you want to record. First of those would be the gain button. L, M, H, low, medium, high. Nothing happens in the low setting on the gain button. And gain is number eight on page four of your notes. In relation to the gain button, the idea is that because these are new news cameras, you may be out shooting at night and obviously you won't be bringing big giant lighting kits with you so the light may not be sufficient during dusk for argument's sake in terms of what you are shooting. Believe it or not, light is also balanced or measured in decibels. With the gain button, if I go to M, I increase the amount of light in a shot by 9 decibels. If I go to H, high, I increase the amount of light in a shot by 18 dB. You may not see it on the little monitor here, but what's actually happening is the camera is electronically cheating and increasing the amount of light in a shot. But the downside of that is that it creates a kind of a pixelated dirt on the screen, which stands out very clearly when you look at it on a monitor. So you only use medium high on the gain button when you're in a situation where you know there isn't enough light or where you know that the audience is used to seeing gain in those situations. Think of night camera footage you've seen on television or think of shots of kind of streets, uh, landscapes at night where it's obviously brought to allow the viewer to see what's going on but the downside of it, as I say, is that it's covered in what we call dirt or grain and the picture is less mucky. That becomes very problematic if you're just shooting a normal studio interview and you accidentally have this button on because the picture will look very, very pixelated and broken up. And the way you know if gain is accidentally on is that if it's on high, you will have 18 dB if you're in the correct status mode. If you're on medium, you will have 9 dB. And in the normal setting, low, nothing and normal shot. Nine, the white balance selection switch we have already discussed and looked at. 10, the power switch we have already discussed and looked at, and 11, the record trigger button we have already discussed and looked at. Similarly, we have looked at the recording level of bu buttons here. Remember, channel one, channel two, and these work in conjunction with the audio setting manual here. So if we switch this down to manual, that's when these come into play. We go back, show you again, display option, and by moving them up and down, you raise or lower the level of whatever channel you are recording on. But as I've emphasized previously, 90% of the time you can leave this on auto and the camera will compress the sound and balance it perfectly for you. Directly above this is the cancel button number 13, which I've showed you its use when you're in media mode 
and you're looking back at a shot that you've chosen to play. Once you're happy that the sound levels are right or whatever, you can press the cancel button and you go back into your key display here. 14, they refer to as the cross-shaped button and set button. And again, we've discussed this in menu mode, up, down, left, right, set. In media mode, up, down, left, right, play uh, with the cancel to stop the play. However, the cross-shaped button and set button has a secondary function. As you know, it allows you to scroll and set in the menu and it allows you to work your way through the media setting. It also does whatever, uh, however, what is called shutter speed. If the menu isn't open, if you're in normal mode and you start pressing this, you will see shutter off at 150, shutter off. However, if I, j I turn it on by pressing the center button and you see the 150 here, I can increase my shutter speed right up to a max of 10,000. You can see the screen goes very dark, can't really see anything on it. Bring it down and I can bring my shutter speed all the way down to 1.625. This gives you a better idea because you can see the screen now. Watch the effect. So we get this stuttering effect on the actual visuals because of shutter speed. I'm not going to go into shutter speed now. I'm going to give you a video connected to the lecture in a week's time uh, that will show you exactly how shutter speed uh, is used. Suffice to say for now, shutter speed is always twice your frame rate. We shoot at a frame rate of 25 frames per second, so your shutter speed should always be set to 1 to 50. And when you want to turn it off, you press the center button again, shutter off, and it's now set to 1 to 50. Number 15 just refers to the operation mode indicator. As you've seen, camera blue, uh, media mode will be green, and if we had a USB in there, it would turn orange. And the last thing to note here is the, uh, or sorry, rather in this section, is the audio monitor level adjustment knob for adjusting the level of the monitor speaker and earphones. What's important to note about this is that it's a standard volume switch. If you have your headphones plugged in and you're playing back a clip in media mode, and this is turned all the way down to nothing, you won't hear anything. You've turned the volume all the way down. It's not that your headphones are broken. You need to turn this monitor switch up so you can hear the volume as recorded. The last section on page four of your notes is the viewfinder section. The first thing we're going to look at is the viewfinder slide lock ring for loosening the ring and adjusting the position of the viewfinder. This is this large wheel here, left to loosen, right to tighten. So when I loosen it, I can actually bring my viewfinder out approximately two or three inches. So it's a comfort thing in relation to the camera operator, the position that they want the viewfinder in. Please bear in mind, if you bring it all the way out, lock it back into position, when you go to put the camera back in the bag, that will not fit, okay? So when you are done, you need to loosen, push all the way back, and lock. That is number one in the viewfinder section. Number two is an eyepiece focus ring for adjusting the visibility. This is a tricky little thing. It's this little lever here. You can see I can move it. If I hold here, you can see I can slide it one way or the other, okay? Not sure how clearly you can see that but I'm basically moving this little raised section here from left on this side to right on that side, okay? What this actually does, it affects the focus when we look into our viewfinder in here. We all have different ranges of eyesight, so you just adjust this to basically suit your own. It actually works in its 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock position in that it's down here as well, so it's easiest to maneuver it by operating like that. And you just adjust that to your own personal settings. Make sure the viewfinder isn't blurred. It doesn't affect your recording quality. Number three is the viewfinder eyepiece lock ring for loosening the ring and adjusting the position of the eye holder. Again, this is down to the individual camera operator. By left to loosening here, I can bring this out approximately two inches, and this just adjusts the magnification between the image that I see in my viewfinder so I can make it bigger or smaller, and that again is a personal choice for the camera operator and does not affect anything to do with the recorded material. Number four is the viewfinder itself, which you will find when you stick your eye up to this, you can see it. And number five is this protective eyepiece. It's a protective cover against external light. We do not want light getting in through the viewfinder here, okay? So the idea behind this is that if there's a bright sun behind me and I go into record mode and stand back, 
Light will come in here, light will bounce off the reflective surface in there and you'll get light spots on your recording. So if you're recording with a strong source of light behind you, you need to make sure that you're literally putting your eye right up to this and blocking any light getting in like so. We're going to look at the LCD monitor. We're on the top of page five of your camera handout. So we're looking at the first box, the LCD monitor, uh, and we're starting with button seven, which is the LCD cover lock release knob. It's a little push button here. We pop this out, and the important thing to remember is that this LCD comes out 90 degrees and no further. It will rotate 180 degrees and no further, and then you can slot it back in. So obviously you can see a full screen representation of whatever your camera is pointing at. Same as you're going to see on the viewfinder when you look into the viewfinder. Now, <coughs> obviously camera operators can choose which way they want this. Some people like to keep it out rather than looking in the viewfinder. They'll keep it out like this so they can look at the picture here. But for now, I just want to work through from button 1 down to 6 in the top column on page 5 of your notes. So here's the LCD monitor itself, obviously. Now, in relation to buttons 2, 3, 4 and 5, these are all located in behind the viewfinder. So when we open this out, you can see LCD bright plus and minus, LCD peaking plus and minus, audio select channel 1, channel 2, auto and manual, and time code display and generator. Let's start with the LCD peaking plus and minus and the LCD bright plus and minus, these two boxes here. These simply affect the quality of the brightness and contrast that you see on the viewfinder yourself. So obviously, the more you press this, the brighter the viewfinder will become. The more you press this, the more extreme the contrast on the viewfinder will come. It's entirely down to the camera operator which way they want to view it. It has no bearing on your recording quality. If you want to return it to factory settings, you simply hold LCD bright and rather LCD bright plus and minus down simultaneously and you hold for three seconds and that will return to factory norm, and the same with LCD peaking. Hold them down for three seconds, and that will return them to factory norm. Directly beneath this, we come on to button number four, the audio recording mode switch. We've discussed this already in the sound section video. So basically, we have two switches, one for channel one sound, one for channel two sound, and the options are auto or manual. If you leave them both on auto, you bring into play a compressor that's built into the camera, so that from a sound point of view, your bars will bounce up along the decibel scale, 40, 30, 20, 10, 0. And because the compressor is on, the camera will ensure in most cases, 95% of cases, that your levels will go above 20, thus turning yellow, and that will be sufficient for sound quality. But it will also ensure that they don't hit the zero, light up the little red box, which means your sound will distort if you record it. 95% of the time, as I say, you are happy to use the auto setting. But on those occasions where the sound is either too loud or too low and the compression device in the camera doesn't work, you can switch these down to manual. When you bring them down to manual, you've got two volume controls here, one for channel 1 and one for channel 2. And by adjusting these, as you can see on the display here, you can 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, raise and lower the quality of the sound that you are getting. So you can maximize it to bounce between 20 and 10, as I've done with channel 1 there and then basically raise up channel 2 to match. And once the bars are bouncing evenly, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, you have optimized sound control. As I say, manually will use maybe 5% of the time. Auto will do for 95% of your recording purposes. The last box in here is what we call the time code uh, box. It consists of a generator switch and a display mode. The display mode asks to see time code or UB for user bits. User bits is set when we are working in a multicam setup, which we won't be doing with these cameras. So we always make sure the display switch is set to TC for time code. And then in relation to the generator switch, there are three options, free, record, and regen. What is time code? Well, first of all, let's look at that. I'm going to set my time code button to record here. I'm going to close my window, and I'm going to open up my menu. When I open up the menu, you will see about four down TCUB, time code user bits. Use the wheel to go down to this, press the set button to open it, and you can see time code preset, UB preset. We want time code, so we press time code preset. We get a digital display that reads 00000000. 000 000 000. 
Now, because we use 16 gigabyte cards, and we can therefore only record up to one hour's worth of material, the hour box means nothing. This is just a signifier, a marker for the particular card. So you call the first card, you use card number one. The second card, you use card number two, etc., etc. These then represent minutes, seconds, and frames. It's 25 frames per second in the uh, electronic uh, digital recording. So what we do here is with our first card put into the uh, uh, slot, we will basically select the hour mark and we will move it up to one to name this card number one. The rest of the seconds will stay as R. And when we are done with that, we press the set button and you can see the time code will be set. We go back to back, exit, and now when we look at our display, you can see that my time code is set to card number one, not minutes, not seconds, and not frames. Time code is used for a number of purposes. Number one, it's the system that the edit suite uses. So the edit suite, when you digitize this material in, doesn't recognize the visuals of the sound. It simply recognizes the time code. So it knows that one shot begins on card number one, zero minutes, zero seconds, and zero frames, and perhaps ends on card number one, uh, 20 seconds, zero, uh, sorry, uh, zero minutes, 20 seconds, and 10 frames. And the idea is that should something, something happen with your edit suite, you are able to use the time code that you will save every time you do an edit session, and, and you can rebuild any material that you may have lost due to problems with the suite. Time code is also used uh, for... Uh, well, I have used it personally over when I've been editing projects and my director has maybe been in a different county or indeed a different country. Uh, he or she can send me a uh, card with the material and the time code on it and put reference points saying, I'm not happy with the cut at 24 minutes, 30 seconds and 10 frames. Can you have a look at that? So it's a handy way of finding way, your way around material when you've begun to cut stuff together. The idea is that each time you put a new card in, you set the time code given the card an identifiable number and then starting with naught minutes, naught seconds and naught frames. When you go into record mode, as I will here, you can see the time code starts to move. So I'm recording my first shot. When I stop record, I now have a first shot on the card that begins at naught minutes, naught seconds and naught frames and ends at naught minutes, five seconds and 19 frames. The next shot, obviously, will begin at that point and will end at that point, nine seconds and 15 frames. So the idea here is that when you digitize the material into your edit system, the edit system reads this time code and knows the in and out time code points for each of the shots. Let's say for argument's sake you've recorded 20 minutes worth of material and you're done for the day. You power down, you take your card out. The next time you put your card in, rather than continuing with that, or rather than setting a new time code, I should say, we move the generator switch down to regenerate, pop it down like that, and that's just basically telling the camera that when you press record again, you want it to continue from the previous time code that's already on the card, which is 9 seconds and 15 frames. So we press this, and you can see it continues from that point there. And our next shot is now 9 seconds, 15 frames, up to 13 seconds and 23 frames. In relation to the free setting here, we only use that again when we're doing multicam setup. So the first time you put a card in, you put this to record. You open your menu, you navigate down to TCUB, you open that up, you set your time code preset by pressing the center switch, and as you saw me do previously, give the first card number one, second card number two, third card number three, etc., etc. The rest remains in the zero figures, and thereafter, whenever using that same specific card, when you power up, you switch this down to regenerate, and you put your card in, and it will regenerate the time code that's already stored on the card.